Thank you, Vishnu. And uh, I'm truly sorry I'm not Sananda. She was, uh, she was very much looking forward to being here. And it's been on our program for many, many weeks now. But unfortunately, she was laid low yesterday by a crippling migraine. So I'm sure I can convey all of your sympathies for a quick recovery as she had to cancel her trip. Uh, but really, uh, in addition to speaking on her behalf, I feel I can speak on mine too, because though I was meeting Mr. Chamaria for the first time today, I realized in listening to him that I found my long-lost twin, because uh, he's actually the slightly bigger twin, because everything that he's talking about are things that uh, my wife and I have really wanted to do and are, in fact, doing on a very much smaller and more modest scale. So uh, I was very, very struck by a number of things he said, because they sounded very much like the things I found myself saying over the years, in particular on the question of the importance of education, uh, where when he speaks of 250 scholarships, the Chandran Tharoor Foundation gives 25 to 30, because that's all we can manage, we're on a much smaller scale. But the idea is the same, to find people who have absolutely no means of continuing their education and giving them an opportunity to do that. I, and I can tell you there's nothing more gratifying then, I mean, for example, one scholarship we gave was to a, a girl whose father was completely blind. He hadn't been blind, he'd been a painter, but he lost his sight and therefore couldn't paint anymore, and the family had literally zero income. And for her, who was a bright student, to be able to go on and study, uh, this blind gentleman came up to me with tears in his eyes, and ultimately there is no greater satisfaction than being able to give people the empowerment that education alone can give them. <coughs> but equally, when Mr. Chamaria spoke about the, the very great importance of keeping girls in school, uh, that's where Sunanda would have leapt up to applaud him, because he's quite right. When there are a lot of studies, the United Nations, the World Bank, Yale University, to name just three studies that I have personally seen that have demonstrated the truth of the dictum that when you educate a boy, you do a good thing, you educate a person, but when you educate a girl, you actually educate a family, transform a community, and ensure the progress of society. There have been studies after studies that have confirmed this. And it's, it's something that I came to the hard way because I used to be asked very often in my UN days about uh, what one thing can actually help societies to develop. And I would always, you know, that's the kind of question that brings out the most bureaucratic in communicators, because I find myself saying, you know, one thing is never enough. There are so many different things we need to do. And there's infrastructure, and there's education, and there's health care. And I was, I was beginning to bore myself with my answer. And then as I kept reading up about these things, I realized, in fact, there is an answer. Because if you have to pick one thing, there is one thing that can actually completely be the closest thing we have to a magic bullet to ensure development. And that one thing is the two-word mantra, educate girls. Now what Mr. Chamari is doing through Akshay Patra, which is keeping girls in school by feeding them, is a different aspect to what Sunanda and I are trying to do through the Chandran Tharoor Foundation. Because yes, the food is, impo is very important because midday meals attract the children, attract their parents to send the children, and it's often the main reason why the parents do send the children to school. But for girls, there is an additional challenge, which is that, uh, as Sunanda would have told you, at a certain age, it becomes extremely important for girls to have adequate toilet facilities. And uh, Sunanda, I remember accompanying me to a prize distribution at a government school in Trivandrum, in Tiruvananthapuram, my constituency, and she wanted to use the facilities, because as usual with the MP, I was running late, and she had been waiting for some time. And the teacher said, no, no, come to the teachers. Uh, and she said, no, I'll use whatever the girls are using. And uh, they were very embarrassed, but when she went to the toilet, she could see why it was little more than a hole in the wall. But when, he, when she went to what the teachers were using, it was not much better. Because in fact, uh, the problem is that even where toilets, proper toilets exist, they're very badly maintained, sanitation is dreadful, and it becomes almost impossible to use them. So what happens to girls? Girls, particularly in our government schools, after a certain age, when they must change uh, a few days a month, 
uh, during the school day, they go to their school and they find there isn't a toilet they can use. Or the toilet is only a hole in the wall. Or there isn't enough running water. Or they have to share the toilet with the boys. Or, ultimately, there is a toilet, but it's unusable. And then girls in this situation simply very often go home because they have no choice but to go somewhere. And when they go home, they often don't come back. So this is why, one of the main reasons why, the figure that Mr. Chamaria gave for dropout rates uh, in our schools, which shows a higher dropout rate for girls than for boys, is true. And we are doing our society a great disservice by not recognizing the great importance of keeping our children in school, and particularly of keeping our girls in school. This is why what Sunanda has been trying to do through the Chandran Thiru Foundation is to bring in toilets to schools, but toilets that will not become filthy within a few weeks of being installed, which has often happened with the conventional toilets that we have constructed through various means, including through the use of my uh, government-provided MP funds. What she has done instead is she has found a phenomenon called the e-toilet. You may wonder, what is an e-toilet? One can't go and go to the toilet on the... On the World Wide Web, you need a physical place. But the e-toilet is an electronically operated toilet that, first of all, rations the use of water. It gauges how long you're in the toilet and flushes accordingly. So X number of seconds, it'll flush, you know, half a liter, and for, for a longer time, it'll flush a full liter or a liter and a half. So water is saved. And then every certain number of flushes which you can program, let's say every 25 flushes, it will actually self-clean the entire toilet not just the facility, but the floor around it as well. So you have a hygienic, usable facility, and it is something that has already been introduced to India. I'm sorry to say it's not an Indian design. The one she saw was an Italian design. I believe there is a German model on the market as well. But what happens is they have so far brought them into high-end museums and so on, where people will put a five-rupee coin to use them. What we want to do is bring them in to our poorest schools, our government schools, to places where people particularly girls can't even dream of having these clean facilities. And so what the Chandran Tharoor Foundation is trying to do and why we're very proud to associate with the excellent work of the Round Table and of Akshay Patra and so on is a contribution towards keeping children in school, keeping girls in school by giving them something that many of us just take for granted, the existence of comfortable toilet facilities in our own schools. So this is uh, the endeavor that she would have spoken to you about, and I'm very proud to represent her and share this, uh, share this uh, message from her to you. Uh, we would like to see your support for all this. She's started off, of course, in uh, Kerala, in particular, in Thiruvananthapuram, where I am, but she's also uh, going to be active in Kolkata. And I'm proud to announce, I'm sorry that she's not the one announcing it, that she has persuaded Shah Rukh Khan to be her her brand ambassador, as it were, for this venture. And uh, I think that uh, Shah Rukh is certainly going to want to bring this uh, idea to Kolkata personally in good time. So there's a tremendous amount happening uh, in, this, in, this, in this work. And as Mr. Chamaria, in speaking about his effort, said they started off feeding 1,500 children, and now they're feeding uh, 2 million, uh, or hoping to get to 5 million before too long, we uh, are uh, at the moment starting off with a more modest target of 100 e-toilets uh, in two or three locations, but we hope that the thing will catch on and we will have a lot more of these, perhaps one day lacks of them uh, in every part of the country. But from small beginnings come bigger objectives and it is so important. It is so important that we dream and it's so important that we help the children to dream through their education. So that wasn't what I was supposed to be here to talk to you about. But I'll put off my Sunanda hat now, and I'll turn back to, uh, to come back to the, uh, the reason that you all asked me to come and speak to you, uh, to say a few words about India in the 21st century, our opportunities, our challenges. But I also want to say that I'm not going to deliver uh, a lecture to you. I don't think that uh, all of you uh, are at the lecture hearing stage, and you've already been exposed to a lot of material, video films, conversations, what I really want to do is to have a dialogue with you all. So I will say a few words because my dear friend Vishnu Sureka insists on it, uh, but I will keep it brief. We all uh, mourned the loss of Elizabeth Taylor last year. You remember that uh, uh, she, was, she was so adored by moviegoers around the world. 
but I want to add that I belong to the Elizabeth Taylor School of Public Speaking. As Elizabeth Taylor said to our husbands, I shall not keep you long. So, so my idea is actually to say just a few words fairly briefly, and then really to turn to you. So I want you to start thinking about what you'd like to hear about from me, so that we can have a true opposing narratives in their mind. One is the narrative that we have just heard, a narrative of poverty and suffering, and this is real. It must not be forgotten. Uh, there is no question that we have uh, more children who have never seen the inside of a school in our country than in all the other countries of the world put together. There is no question that we have more poor people living below the UN World Bank poverty line of $1.25 a day, which, as you know, translates into 75 rupees a day. And at that level, it's not just the 55% that that slide said, but in fact 70% of our population that lives in less than 75 rupees a day. Our poverty line calculated by our planning commission is at 32 rupees a day in the cities, 26 rupees a day in the villages. And you try and live on 32 rupees. A couple of young men have just done that and there's, a, there's an article about their experiment. It is very, very hard indeed how much you have to give up just to be able to survive on that kind of money. And yet there are something like 300 million people living below that amount of money in our country. So poverty is real and it cannot be denied. We cannot flee from it. And so many of our, the things that we all take for granted, we go and see a Bollywood movie. Uh, we make more films than any other country in the world, four times the number of Bollywood movies every year than there are in Hollywood. But do you know that 15 million of our people can't see them because they are blind? And almost all of them are blind for preventable reasons for reasons to do with deficiency, with the failure of, uh, to be able to afford the most simple uh, operations that would have given them back their sight. Uh, examples like that, you know, we manufacture AIDS medication for so many countries in the world, generic medication, and yet in our country there are, as we know, at least three and a half million sufferers from AIDS HIV who can't afford that medicine because we have no way of giving it to them free whereas in foreign countries, governments are able to do that, and so on and so forth. I can give you example after example, but I know that you don't need those examples. You know how real this problem is, or you wouldn't be here today because you are here today since you are, through your presence, making a contribution to overcoming that narrative that you have heard. You are here because you want to help overcome poverty, and you are here because you are helping to overcome poverty. So that is one narrative, and it's very important that we be conscious of it. But then there is the other narrative, what uh, people of another party might have called the India shining narrative. And that is the narrative that speaks of India, triumphant India, as a superpower of the 21st century. And I have to say that, um, well, there are many elements in that narrative that I like and have perhaps contributed to. I'm not particularly one of those who goes around thumping his chest and using the word superpower. In fact, I became slightly notorious last year when I said that, or late in 2010, when I said that we can't call ourselves a superpower when we're still super poor. And the truth is that we are still super poor. We still have enormous internal challenges to overcome, like the ones we've been talking about. But what does this narrative base itself on? It bases itself on, quite rightly perhaps, first of all, on India's extraordinary economic progress. Some of you may not know this, perhaps most of you don't know this, but at the end of next month, according to the International Monetary Fund, India is just about to be declared the third largest economy in the world. Now, how can that be? We all know that the largest is the US, the second largest is China, and the third largest is actually Japan, which is a $4.3 trillion economy, whereas India's is only a $1.3 trillion economy. Not counting all our black money, which we have no idea what the numbers are, but the answer is that there is a calculation known as purchasing power parity, which takes into account, rather the way in which our planning commission did on the poverty figures, which takes into account the actual value of, of our rupee when we buy something. A dollar in America buys far less than the same dollar converted to 49 rupees in India can buy you. So when we take purchasing power parity into account, or PPP, then India's 1.3 trillion actually works out to 4.06 trillion. And in this fiscal year, ending on the 31st of March, Japan will not grow. They had that terrible earthquake and tsunami 
and of course the Fukushima nuclear disaster, they may even have negative growth this year. They may go below 4.3 trillion, whereas our 4.06 will grow at the very least by 7%, 6.9% is what our government is projecting when the numbers are in. So we will, in fact, overtake Japan in this fiscal year, and we will become the third largest economy in the world. So that is a very important responsibility as well as a triumph. It shows that we have become a major player in the world. But at the same time, it also means that we have been able to move up in a very significant way up the ladder of the world's nations, but also move up in our ability to overcome the problems that our people are facing. Look, for example, at the way in which we got to that extraordinary figure. You know that the world has been going through a global economic recession for the last three years, almost four years now, since late 2008. And you also know that during that time, many countries have been having major setbacks in their economies. There is almost no significant economy in the world, with the exception of China, which didn't have at least one quarter of negative economic growth. But for us in India, we, our worst quarter was at something like 6.2%. We never actually went down. And why was that? Four good reasons. The first is our Reserve Bank had very conservative, sensible economic policies. They didn't allow our banks to be tempted by credit default swaps and all these toxic securities that laid waste the, uh, the banks of the Western uh, economies. Second is the very important fact that Indians are themselves the engines of the Indian economy, whereas a country like China is essentially doing a great deal of import-export, and something like 70% of it or 75% of its GDP growth comes from international trade. In India, that's only about 20%. The remaining 80% of our GDP growth comes from Indians producing goods and services for other Indians, and that we're able to continue to do. A third factor was that, again, something very different about India, is that whereas merchandise exports naturally went down during the recession, because Western countries couldn't afford to buy them anymore on the same levels, our services exports kept going up. We continued exporting IT services, business process outsourcing services. And so, since 58% of our GDP growth comes from services, we actually were able to grow despite the economic trouble. And finally, the fourth factor was our remittances. Not FDI, not foreign direct investment, which went down every year during the recession and today stands as low as $19 billion. But the remittances from ordinary Indians, often blue-collar workers in the Gulf countries, were so impressive that during the recession, the 2008-2009 fiscal year, they sent $46 billion to India. During the following fiscal year, when the recession was worse, our workers abroad sent $55 billion to India and the last fiscal year, the one after that, came to 57. So Indians believe in India. And even when they're working abroad, they send their money home because they believe that our country has a future. I was just telling an interviewer today that there is a Gallup poll that has demonstrated that Indians are technically the most, uh, most optimistic country in the world because a larger percentage of Indians, particularly young Indians, say that they believe their future, their tomorrow, will be better than their parents yesterday. And that faith in the future is what I think we in India can be so proud of. One of the elements in that faith in the future, Vishnu has already mentioned in his introduction, which is what we can call the demographic dividend. The fact that 65% of our population is under 35, the fact that 100 million young people are going to be entering the workforce in the next decade, all of this means that for the next 30 years, we should have a youthful, dynamic, working-age population at a time when the rest of the world, including China, is aging. But there is a catch, and the catch is that this productive workforce will only be able to produce if we can educate them or train them, and if we can grow our economy in such a way that our economy offers them opportunities, opportunities that they're able to seize to be able to make a, to be able to make a productive contribution to our country. That's so important. You already heard about education, so fundamentally vital. But where the classic sort of high school, college education doesn't work for some children, 
We have to offer them vocational training. Look at our culture. A carpenter is a son of a carpenter. A plumber is a son of a plumber. The only way they learn is by learning from a father. Whereas in a country like ours, it is a crying shame that with so many young able-bodied people around, we actually have a shortage of masons for our building sites. We have a shortage of trained, qualified professionals in all these vocations that are so indispensable to building India of tomorrow. And therefore, we need to create vocational training institutions across the country that will train masons and carpenters and plumbers, even if their fathers were not masons and carpenters and plumbers. And to be able to do that, we would, we would need to invest. We need to have the political will, but also the resources to invest in this everywhere. So that in every district, there is at least one, if not more, well-supplied, well-equipped, hands-on training, providing vocational training institutes. So with that and with education, we can do well. Provided, again, we also allow our economy to grow. We don't stifle it through hartals and bands and political opposition of various sorts. But we move forward in a constructive way to creating opportunities so that people can actually work to improve their own lives and create a better future for their children. This is the challenge facing us. Then the demographic dividend will truly be a huge demographic success for us. But if we fail, if we don't get that right, the alternative is something that I first saw as a teenager in Calcutta in the late 60s and early 70s. The alternative is Naxalism. 165 of our districts today, of our 602 districts, are today affected to greater or lesser degree by Maoist violence. Now, I'm not saying that every one of them, every one of those districts is consumed by violence. The government counts every district where there's even been one incident. But what is happening with these Maoists? Very often these are young men, tribal young men, who feel that they have no opportunities in our society, in our economy. They don't have the qualifications to get any jobs. And so they feel they have nothing to lose by picking up the gun because they have no stake in the future of India because it's not their future. They have nothing to gain from it. That's a terrible feeling. And if we want to end the phenomenon of Maoism, if we want to end the danger of misguided ideologues from the educated classes going off and persuading young people that their future lies by picking up a gun, then we need to be able to provide better, more widespread education and vocational training throughout our country so that our young people will not go that way. I can assure you that you don't need to be a very profound student of history to realize that in every country in the world, there is nothing more dangerous than unemployed young men. And we must make sure that we provide employment to our young people and that we equip them through our education to be able to seize that employment. If we do that, I genuinely believe the future for our country is very bright. Because genuine progress has been made. I know it's fashionable in certain circles in Kolkata to say that uh, the rich have become richer and the poor have become poorer. That is simply not true. Yes, the rich have become richer. We cannot deny that. 20 years of economic liberalization have freed the creative energies of the Indian people and those who have been able to take advantage of them have certainly prospered. But that is something we should be proud of, not ashamed of. So the rich have become richer. But I'm not just talking about our per capita going up. We all know that if Mukesh Ambani walked into this room right now, our per capita income would immediately increase. But if Mukesh Ambani walks out again, none of us would feel any fatter in our wallets. And we would not be left any more wealthy. So it's not just per capita income. It is the fact that Planning Commission studies have established that every year for the last 10 years, in fact 12 years, we have pulled about 1% of our population out from below the poverty line. And that in a country our size is about 10 million people who are no longer poor. That is a grounds for hope. Yes, last year the figure was down to 0.78%. That's still about 10 million people since we're now about 12, 1.2 billion. But I'm just saying that 10 million people a year coming out of poverty is something we can be proud of and we should work for. I mean, one of the challenges facing someone like Mr. Chamaria, one of the challenges facing people like my wife Sunanda and the young people at the round table is the cynicism of ordinary Indians who say, what hope is there? It'll be a drop in a bucket. The problems are so immense. You're wrong. The problems of yesterday are being solved today. And your assistance and your faith will ensure that these problems are solved for tomorrow. That the, those who are poor today need not remain poor tomorrow. That is the hope that we must work for.
You know, my old boss, Kofi Annan, when he was, under, when he was Secretary General of the United Nations, he used to love telling a story about a hen and a pig discussing the world's problems. And the hen said to the pig, you know, we have all these problems in the world, why don't we do something to solve them? And the pig said, we're only hen and a pig, what can we do to solve them? And the hen said, look, why don't we just break down these problems, take them one by one, and together we can solve them. The pig said, tell me how. So the hen said, look, take hunger, for example. I produce the eggs and you produce the bacon and between us we can get hunger licked. So the pig thinks for a minute, kicks up his hind trotter and says, aha, uh -huh. so you'll produce the eggs and I'll produce the bacon. Huh? So yours is a contribution. Mine is total commitment. <laughs> but I just want to assure you that the foundations represented here today are not asking you to be the pigs in that story. All they're asking for is a contribution because we all have things that we are doing through our normal life, our working lives, to contribute to the betterment of our society. Even by being good at our own profession, we are actually helping India. A good accountant, a good lawyer, a good executive, a good clerk, a good student, as long as you do well what you're supposed to be doing well, you are helping the country. Don't get me wrong. But an additional contribution to help those who are not in a position to help themselves is what these organizations are seeking. And I hope that after this evening, you will leave here sensitized to the great importance of moving in that direction. Now what else do I foresee for India? I do foresee for India in the 21st century a serious amount of progress in pulling people out of poverty. We've got three revolutions we can talk about already. There's been a green revolution, you all know about that, in food grain production. Perhaps the time has come for a second green revolution since many of the old techniques are now wearing out, but we've got that. There's actually been a white revolution in milk production. You all know the story of Anand dairy and how it spread across the country and there is now self-sufficiency in milk in our country which wasn't the case in the 1950s and there has also been a blue revolution in the development of our fisheries but the benefits of these three revolutions have not yet reached the people at the bottom of our society of our society and the truth is that whether we speak of nine percent or eight percent or seven percent growth the purpose of that growth has to be targeting the 25% of our population who are frankly at the moment beyond the reach of all the efforts of our government and of our society to pull them up into a positive direction. Now I'm not going to spend the entire talk being gloomy, though I'm not gloomy as you know, I'm very upbeat and I feel that we must recognize the gloom in order to dispel it. In fact, um, I've always been inspired from my UN days by a wonderful line from the once first lady of the US, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was asked again about some of the efforts that people make and the problems are so vast. And she said, better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And that is absolutely true. You may not be able to construct the floodlights overnight to dispel the darkness. But if each of us goes and lights a candle, the darkness will disappear. And that's what we need to work towards. Now, one aspect of India in the 21st century that I am going to leave you with is the extreme importance of the use of technology in furthering India's progress and success. I've often said that we need to use computer jargon, both the hardware of development and the software of development. We need the hardware of development, the infrastructure, the roads, the railways, the ports, the airports, the sewage systems, and we need the software of development the human resources we've been talking about this evening, education, vocational training, healthcare, all of that, both needs to be done for our country to truly prosper. That we all agree. But technology as a means is very important. I'm going to tell you why. I wrote a book a few years ago, four years ago, called The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone. And it was about my reflections on 21st century India, at least on the basis of the f most of the first decade of the century. And in that, the title itself must have put some people off or made some people surprised. Well, the reason for the title is the very first essay is a sort of Panchatantra-type animal fable about India as an elephant, a large, ponderous beast, you know, mired in mud, covered with flies, covered in dust, slow to move, slow to change, which somehow in recent years appears to be acquiring the stripes of a sinewy, lithe and agile tiger. And that's two-thirds of the title. Where does the cell phone come in? Well, the cell phone to me is the instrument that is most emblematic of the change of India from elephant to tiger. Why do I say that? 
Because when I left Kolkata in 1975 to go to graduate school in the United States, the entire country of India had about 600 million citizens, and we had perhaps 2 million landline telephones. Telephones were so rare that unless you were somebody important, a politician or a wealthy businessman or a doctor or a journalist, you probably wouldn't get a telephone. You would have to sit on a waiting list and wait for years. What is more, elected members of parliament even had the privilege of allocating 15 telephone connections to those they deemed worthy. Such a major privilege it was to give somebody a telephone. That's the story when I left in 1975. But I should tell you that even if you got one of those telephones, it wasn't necessarily a blessing. In Calcutta in the late 1960s, I remember the telephone sat in the front hall of our apartment and we would walk past it every morning and conduct a very special ritual, which was to lift up the receiver and see if there was a dial tone. <laughs> Most often there wasn't a dial tone. Hmm? Or you could dial a number when you got a dial tone and the words you heard more often than hello, were wrong number. And if you didn't get a wrong number, you got something else. You actually found yourself stumbling across somebody else's conversation. They're talking to each other in full flow, completely unaware that you're listening into them. There was even a technical term for this. We called it a cross connection. These were connections that made us really cross. <laughs> then if you wanted to call another city, let's say from Kolkata, you wanted to call Delhi, you would have to book something called a trunk call and sit by the phone all day waiting for the phone to ring. Because if it rang and you didn't answer it, you'd go back to the bottom of the queue and wait another 8-10 hours for your trunk call to come. Or you could pay 8 times the going rate for something called a lightning call. But in those days, even lightning struck very slowly in India. And the lightning call took about half an hour to come, rather than the 8 hours of, of the trunk calls. I mean, so woeful was the service of this public sector monopoly that when a member of parliament stood up as late as 1984 to complain about it in parliament, our then communications minister replied in a lordly manner that telephones are a luxury, that communications are a luxury in a developing country, not a right, that the government had no obligation to provide better service, and that the honorable member was not happy with his telephone, could he please return it since there was an eight-year-long waiting list for that inadequate instrument. Then you fast forward to when I wrote my book in 2007. When I finished the book in 2007, April, I had just been able to record with great pride that that month, India had broken the world record for new telephone sales, establishing telephone connections by selling 7 million mobile phone cell, uh, SIM cards in the month of April 2007, which at that point was more telephone connections than had been made by any country in any one month in the entire history of global communications. So I wrote that and I sent it off to the press and the book got printed and bound and arrived in all good bookstores in December of 2007 and by that time the figure was already out of date because India had broken its old one record three times that year and by December we had sold 8.3 million cell phones. The blessed book is still in print because people keep reading it so it hasn't yet been revised. It's now in its 12th hardback printing and the figures are completely out of date. In 2008, we crossed 10 million cell phones. By 2009, the 15 million barrier was reached. And in the last three months of 2010, India sold 20 million SIM, SIM cards, mobile phone SIM cards, each of those months. In other words, in one month, we were selling 10 times the number of phone connections than the entire country had when I, as a 19-year-old, went off to study in America. What a transformation. But even more important is than the numbers. It is not just a question of numbers. Numbers are fine. We're now the second largest telephone market in the world. We've overtaken the United States. There are something like 850 million SIM cards in existence in our country. About 625 million individual subscribers. So the only market in the world that's larger than us is China, but we're growing faster, so we might even overtake them. So all the numbers are there, but much more significant is who is carrying these mobile phones. As you all know, those of you who have been driven here by a driver or have one at work, you know that he's carrying a mobile phone and you didn't give it to him. He can afford to have one himself. What is more, it's not just drivers who are sitting in air-conditioned cars. Go to the side streets of Delhi 
where we have the wonderful Istriwalas, chap with a wooden cart that looks like it was devised in the 16th century, on which rests a coal-fired steam iron that looks like it was invented in the 17th century, but in his pocket he'll have a 21st century instrument, a mobile phone. Because most of the calling plans in our country, the incoming calls are free, so it costs him nothing to get a call telling him which apartment or house to come to collect a sari or a shirt to be ironed. In Kerala, I was visiting the country farm of a friend of mine, about 20 kilometers away from any place you'd consider urban. It was a hot day, so he said, hey, would you like some coconut water, some dab, you know, some nariyal pani? And I said, sure, what, what better, more refreshing drink can you drink on a hot day in a hot part of India? So he pulled out his mobile phone, dialed a number, and a voice said, I'm up here. And right on top of the nearest coconut tree, with his lungi tied around his knees, a hatchet in one hand and a mobile phone in the other, was a local toddy tapper who brought down a coconut for us to drink. Fishermen in Kerala are now carrying mobile phones out to sea. First of all, there are programs on GPS that tell them where to fish, where the best shoals of fish are available. The government is supporting these programs, as well as some private agencies. And then when they catch their fish and they come back close to the coast, they basically dial the market towns up and down the coast to see where they'll get the best price for the fish they've just caught. And then they steer their boat to that town. Forget Kerala, anywhere in India, including very much in West Bengal, just five years ago, or maximum ten years ago, ask yourself, what would a farmer do after the harvest? He would harvest his crop, then either he would go or he would send an able-bodied male relative, maybe an eight-year-old, ten-year-old boy, walking 10, 12 kilometers in the hot sun to the nearest market town to find out if the market was open, to find out if the cr crop he had harvested could be sold at that Monday, to find out what price he would fetch, what the competition was. Then this young boy would walk again 10, 12 kilometers back in the hot sun to the farm. Then they would load their carts and head off to market. Half a day's back-breaking labor, which is now solved by one two-minute phone call. In other words, technology in India today is not the preserve of the elite. My dear friends from the CPM, so dearly beloved in Bengal and Kerala, who oppose the introduction of mobile phones to India, saying that mobile phones are a plaything for the rich and they should be banned in India. Those same CPM netas all have mobile phones, but more important, the fact remains that these mobile phones are empowering the underclass in ways that 45 years of talking about socialism never did. That is the transformation that we're seeing in our country today. So technology is very much a key to the future of India in the 21st century. We've talked about opportunities, we've talked about challenges, but let me talk about something that truly gives hope. It's the way in which technology has helped the poor through the mobile phones, where illiterate people are now no longer having to find somebody to write a letter for them to their families because they can now speak to them and hear their voices themselves in the village. When that kind of thing is happening, you know the country is moving forward. Today, if you go and Google the phrase frugal innovation, the first 20 stories you get will all be about India. Because we have, through our famous jugaad, our ability to improvise on a shoestring, we have started creating innovations that the rest of the world is beginning to notice. Our country has invented an electrocardiogram that is 120th the cost of cardiogram machines in the world and produces the same quality results. We have introduced all sorts of frugal innovations of a number of technologies, cheap refrigeration, the, as you know, the cheapest small vehicle in the world, the Tata Nano. All of these things have come out of Indian brains thinking, how can we economically strip away unnecessary layers of expense by re-engineering these things and actually creating the capacity to be able to, um, to improve our country for the better in this way. And in this way, Technology is working. In fact, I was asked by the University of Toronto in Canada to inaugurate something called their India Innovation Institute. Can you imagine foreigners are now studying Indian innovation on their campuses? And that is where our future lies. Today, there are already, for companies like GE and Philips, there are more researchers in their Indian offices than there are in their parent offices in America or Europe. And we're not just doing you know, call center work for Western consumers needing to book an airline ticket or complain about a, a, a washing machine that's broken down. That kind of work is going on, but we also have Indians sitting doing extremely sophisticated uh, work devising airline wings for Boeing. We have people sitting around doing constructive work 
in a number of sophisticated areas of cutting-edge research, biotech, for example. And all of this is applying the Indian skill for learning hard, working hard, dedication, and hard work to the 21st century challenges of creating new solutions to the problems of today's world. And that, I think, is what gives me the greatest amount of hope, the feeling that we will use not just the symbols of the bullock cart, the cycle, all these symbols that our parties are using in their elections. We will be using something that no election commission symbol has. Our brains, our faith in technology, our innate mathematical skill, and our own hard work to build and create the India of tomorrow. It is also true that the hardware still needs to be built. It has been estimated that 80% of the infrastructure needed by India by 2030 doesn't exist. So in the next 20 years, we have to build a huge amount of things. We're estimating, for example, that we need to spend $1.25 trillion in just energy and power generation. I'm sure you all remember the load shedding in Calcutta. I believe it's much less now, uh, but I grew up with it. We must live in an India where load shedding is a forgotten word, is a quaint expression, the way in which the phone without a dial tone or the expression wrong number has now become. We have to make that history. We have to create the power that the, our society needs to manufacture to move ahead. We have to make ourselves truly a knowledge economy by improving our education systems. That's why our government has come up with a Right to Education Act, but is equally moving ahead with a whole other slew of educational reforms, including regulating the uh, advent of foreign service providers in the education sector. So the best standards of world-class education can be brought to India as well. We are trying to satisfy our people's hunger to better themselves. And that ultimately, it seems to me, is what is going to give us the great strength that India needs. And I promised I wouldn't speak long, and yet I have taken far, far too long. I do want to leave time for some questions and answers with all of you. Um, and so I will, I, will, I will end here, but I want to end with a story which in many ways captures the spirit of what I have been saying, Mr. Chamare has been saying, Sunanda has been saying to you in her absence, uh, a story which is from our ancient Puranas. It's a typical story of a sage and his disciples, where the sage says to his disciples, when does the night end? And the disciples say, why, dawn, of course. And the sage says, I know that. But when does the night end and the dawn begin? So the first disciple is from my part of India, you know, our tropical south. He says, I know, I know, he says, it's when the first streaks of sunlight shine on the palm fronds of the coconut trees, swaying gently in the breeze above the, breeze above the paddy fields. That's when you know that the night ends and the dawn begins. So he says, no, my son. So the second disciple is from the cold and snowy north where my wife comes from. She says, I know, I know. It's when the first shafts of sunlight glint off the snow and ice on the mountain tops of the Himalayas. That is when the night ends and the dawn begins. The sage says, no, my son. No, my daughter. He says, it is when you are able to hold the hand of a child in the darkness. When you are able to bring him out from the shadows and give him the light to read, to think, to dream for himself, that is when the night ends and the dawn begins. As you've heard this evening, there have been many, many, and there still are many a dark night for the people, the majority of the people of our country. But I hope I've given you enough reasons to hope that together we can work to ensure that we will give them and all of us a brighter dawn in the 21st century. Thank you for listening to me, and Jai Hind. So uh, how shall we do the question and answer period? Uh, Vishnu, are you going to have a handheld mic in the audience? Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we have volunteers with mics in all corners. Excellent. We would request to make it a real sure. interaction to please raise your hands and you can ask your queries. Yeah, behind you, please. Uh, so if you raise your hands and I'll ask Vishnu to pick the people to ask the questions. 
Vishnu? Vishnu. All right, there's already somebody with a mic, so you start. Yeah, uh, yeah. On Hello. a lighter note, I was thinking I'll ask you a different question. Uh, do you think in the 21st century, India has actually lost its sense of humor? I'm asking this, of course, Inri, uh, your tweets on the... <laughs> Yes, exactly, the sense of humor. Actually, you know, I wrote um, in my book, Elephant, Tiger, and the Shelf, and you'll find an essay. Oh, okay. No, it's okay, I can go back there, don't worry. You got one more to spare? All right. Can you hear me? It is, it is audible. All right. Well, in that case, uh, yeah, in, in that book, The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone, I actually have an essay lamenting the lack of political humor in India. And that was written way before I considered entering politics myself. So you can imagine that I turned out to be the, the first victim of, uh, of the lack of <laughs> political humor in our country. I actually remarked that it was so strange that you can read all the writings and speeches and so on of most of our political leaders over the years, and you'd be hard-pressed to find uh, a good joke. I mean, they were just not into it. Mahatma Gandhi actually had a sense of humor, because uh, you may remember when... Uh, Vishnu, why don't you come and sit here, then you can identify the speaker, the questioner, so somebody can play traffic cop here. Uh, so Mahatma Gandhi, once he, he went in his loincloth and in his, his half dhoti and a shawl to call upon uh, His Majesty the King Emperor, George VI, in England. And the British were quite offended by the sight of this, as Winston Churchill called him, this half-naked fakir striding up the steps of Buckingham Palace. So one of the journalists asked him, do you think you were appropriately dressed to meet the king? And Mahatma Gandhi replied, I thought the king was wearing enough for the two of us. <laughs> now, can you think of a modern political leader with that kind of sense of humor? Sadly, no. Uh, but you're right, to some degree we have uh, lost our sense of humor. And partly I think it's also if I may say so, the fault of our media, which is so quick to seize upon even innocent and lighthearted remarks and deliberately make them into something sensationalist because that's the only way they can get their TRPs to go up is to manufacture controversies. And so you find that um, that episode that you were referring to, when a journalist asked me during our austerity drive, so Mr. Minister, next time you travel, will you travel cattle class? And I, having lived in England, I mean, in, in America for so many years, and knowing that in the Western world, cattle class is a very routine, banal expression. If you enter cattle class on Google, that's the definition you'll get. It's the, a term of insult to the airlines for the way in which they herd people in like cattle. It is not an insult to the passengers. Thinking that everybody in India knew that because the journalist was asking me that question, I replied using his phrase as well. And I said, yes, I'll travel in cattle class out of solidarity with all our holy cows which I thought was not a bad joke in the circumstances, provided you took it in that spirit. But little did I anticipate the bad faith with which people would deliberately manufacture a crisis out of it. And uh, I was traveling in Africa for the government, and my back was turned for 24 hours, and the whole media had erupted, and we were having me being denounced, and chief ministers calling for me to resign, and people saying this is some elitist fellow who thinks that economy class passengers are cattle, and by the time you translated that into Marathi and Gujarati and Bengali and Malayalam, my political career was as good as over. I mean, it's just... It's ridiculous. Can I... Yes. yes. Who has the second Yes. Yes. Right. Thank you for this wonderful evening and uh, erudite talk on, and giving us hope for the future. I just wanted to ask you, we have all addressed and we are very convinced that underprivileged children need to be taken care of and that is the future. My question to you is, and I give you the liberty not to answer it because it's a sensitive question, how do we tackle underprivileged politicians and leaders who are going to, who are going to shape the future of the 21st century India and if you don't, if you select not to answer it, at least give us an inspiration why after you and I studied in Xavier's and you went off to uh, America to get, get educated, held one of the best offices of the world, 
Why did you come back to wretched India to become a politician? Well, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said when he was asked for a message to some function or the other, he said, my life is my message. And I suppose I can say that my life is my answer to your question because what I have done is I have shown through my own choices my faith in the need for our politics to include people of a different sort of background and orientation than the ones who have traditionally gone in. Look, let's face it, I have come from a middle-class professional background. To this day, my mother detests the fact that I'm in politics. Uh, our families all assumed that if you, if you have anything in your head, you have to study hard, do your homework well, pass exams well, get good marks, get a good degree, get to a good college, get to, get to a good job. That's what you're there to do. And it's the people who can't pass the exams, who aren't smart enough to do that, who will end up in politics. That's been basically the standard middle-class attitude. But I think we're doing ourselves a great disservice. In a democracy, we get the leadership we deserve. And if we end up abdicating, if we, I mean the educated middle class with our values, our upbringing, our sense of place in society and our, uh, our, 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 our professional instincts and training, if we abdicate the political space, then there will simply not be people like us in politics. They'll either be the extremely rich, the Maharajas and Zamindars, or they'll be the sons and grandsons and great-grandsons of politicians from the national struggle days. Or they'll be what the Marxists call the lumpen proletariat. The people from the real bottom who have absolutely nothing to gain, no education, no opportunities in society, and so will use politics as the only viable vehicle for their self-advancement. If that's all you want, then you have no right to complain that you have leaders that you are ashamed of. If you want to have a political leadership in our country, that is, frankly, fully worthy of the kind of people you are, then you need to vote for parties and individuals who are like a Dr. Manmohan Singh, who are like, I don't want to pick individual names because then I will be accused of, of, of one thing or the other, so let me just say, who are like the handful of people in our politics who do approach the process of governance with middle-class values and a professional mindset. Because the fact is, in our politics... In our politics, 95% of our politicians have never done anything else in their lives but politics. They started politics in the days of the Chhatra Parishad or the you know, Kerala Students' Union or whatever it is in different states, and they went right there from their student days in politics and went all the way up uh, to being councillors and panchayat members and, and, and MLAs and MPs and so on, and that's their entire career. So my argument is not that that's bad. You must have people like that who work through the grassroots, but you must also have people of a different background because they can bring a different orientation into politics. So the moment I was given an opportunity to contest, and I did choose to contest, I didn't get parachuted into politics in the Rajya Sabha. I came in through the Lok Sabha where I had to go out and persuade people to vote for me. Uh, and the hottest month of the hottest state, I was able to do that. And I did it because I wanted the legitimacy that came from that kind of public support. But also because, quite frankly, I felt that if people like me are constantly assumed to have no chance, then how on earth are we going to get our country equipped to be able to play a role, a meaningful role, in this extremely globalized 21st century world? And for these reasons, I, I must say that I, um, I'm very, to be honest, uh, I, I'm not being excessively immodest. I'm very proud that I have, have been able to demonstrate through my own experience that however tough it is, it's a challenge worth taking on. Now, in my own case, I went through an Agni Pariksha that I wouldn't wish on anybody else. Uh, I, I've suffered a great deal uh, from my, my efforts, but that was also because I became a little too visible for my own good. And there are, you know, uh, it used to be said in the days of the French Foreign Legion that the first head that sticks itself above the parapet is the one that will be shot off first. So uh, pioneers are, are usually the ones who get... Um, get into trouble, and I was a bit of a pioneer in coming in from my sort of background, but no relative ever in politics, and somebody who was coming in uh, from a different mindset, and what is worse, having lived abroad for three-fourths of his life, to come in and actually seek to bring my orientation and my, my mindset into the governmental process was a real problem that others who are younger than me, and perhaps may have even less to lose than I had when I came here, will be willing to, to take on the same challenges, and that we will gradually see that an educated, increasingly middle-class India, McKinsey says by 2025, 525 million Indians will be middle-class, 
I hope that an educated and increasingly middle class India will create an educated and increasingly middle class political base as well. Uh, Dr. Yes, so Vishnu sir. is going to pick people from front and back and middle and left and right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Tharoor, uh, our country started uh, progressing only after the license permit Raj was, you know, abolished by Mr. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh when he was the finance minister. Now, the major problem today in our education uh, area is it is a highly regulated and we still have the worst kind of license permit Raj in, in, in the education. Do you recently, the UGC has put a condition that in a cities like Calcutta or Bombay or Delhi, to have a college which is affiliated to university, you need to have at least three acres of land. Now, three acres of land in Calcutta city will cost you not less than something around three, four hundred crores. Now, and you get only 60 students who can start. Now, tell me, 300 crores, 60 students, how, many, how much fees can you charge to justify this kind of investment? And still, you know, the, you have an AICT, you have uh, UGC, and you have an affiliation, and you have to follow their curriculum, which is absolutely outdated, and you have conditions which you have to follow, which, like, if you follow, you land up a very, very mediocre uh, education institution. There is no scope of any innovations or any use of technology or any change of curriculum. You know, since you are in the a party which is in power uh, and you are so uh, passionate about educating the youth. This impossible almost, the, the doors of the private sector is ab absolutely closed for any kind of innovation or any kind of development in the education thanks to the government of India. Well, that's a very, very good and insightful and knowledgeable question, um, which I must say I am very uh, anxious to help overcome this. We have a number of educational reform bills pending before the parliament. We have a number of education reform bills pending before the parliament. If you don't mind listening to that whining while I'm talking. I have my, my, both my mobiles are off. All right. so, couldn't we? I, after Anna Hazari taught us about the Maun Vrat, I always put my mobiles in Anna Hazari mode. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the fact is that... Um, one of the things I'm quite willing to do is to raise a question in Parliament about this. You know, I don't know whether the, uh, amongst the reform bills that are pending will be one about this. But it seems to me entirely feasible to create an exception for metro, metropolitan colleges and universities, where the three-acre requirement can immediately be waived. Because after all, you can have a perfectly good, I mean, I, I've lived in New York. The City University of New York occupies just basically one skyscraper. Uh, uh, it is a new school, same thing, which is a very prestigious university, is in a building. One building is not even a half an acre, it's just a building. But the fact is, in cities you should be able to run a university that way also. And I'm going to try and recommend that some such exception be considered. I'll go home tonight and write a, write a question to the Minister of Education on this. Uh, so you spoke about uh, the excellent purchase parity uh, and uh, how it is going to take India to the third largest economy of the world. At the same time, so you spoke about uh, the need to eradicate ourselves from super poverty to become a superpower. So what is your vision of India? Is it going to be a country, rich country of poor people or poor country of rich people? <laughs> I hope it will be a rich country of, of adequately... Uh, of adequate income people. Let me put it this way. We probably are right now uh, uh, a rich country of poor people in the sense that the riches, including the natural resources of this land, are vast. The human resources of this land are vast. And yet, as I said, 70% of our population lives below the UN World Bank poverty line of $1.25 a day. So there is no question that we are today a rich country of poor people. But if we can manage the riches of our country better, if we can gear them in, along the ways that I have discussed and described to you in my remarks, I don't see why we couldn't lift the, the, the people at the bottom of the pyramid, to use that expression of C.K. Prahlad's, up above the, the poverty line. We're never going to, no country in the world is purely a country of rich people. America isn't a country of rich people. There are a lot of rich people, but as you've seen from the recent Occupy Wall Street movement, 
the one percent of the population uh, is considered rich and the rest consider themselves to be middle class or low middle class and and the truth is that if that happens in india i'll be a happy man if in my lifetime i can see a country where we don't have the kind of extreme and wretched poverty that we've grown up seeing in our country if everybody can have three decent meals a day a roof over their heads adequate health care within five ten kilometers walk of their places of residence maximum ideally five kilometers uh, or less if they can have the opportunity to send their children to decent schools where they'll actually learn something and where the teachers aren't absent and if after that they can get jobs in an economy that is growing and thriving enough to offer them these jobs if all of that is possible then i frankly don't care whether we're rich or poor i think we'll be happy great yeah uh, good evening sir one second one second uh, let me point out the, who uh, yeah the lady good evening, here doctor what i wanted to ask was like we are talking about india being the third about to become a third super economic power and all that and we are painting such rosy pictures about india's economy but in the un list of human development index we have slipped 134th so isn't that some kind of a paradox no it's it's a very very real uh, issue and we've gone actually from 128th to 134th so we're not even not even uh, we were never good to begin with in that now to some degree you can quarrel about these rankings because the the measurements can't be scientific I mean, there are uh, lots of subjectivities involved in some of these numbers but still it is pretty shame making and one of the reasons to shame making is the level of malnourishment in our society where manmohan singh ji himself has said that it's a national shame that so many of our children uh, they they're not necessarily hungry but they're not getting enough to eat and they're therefore malnourished and a malnourished child is going to be an underperforming child in future when he becomes an adult because that child will not have developed the brain power the muscle power to be a productive member of our society you find serious problems in human de- development indicators in healthcare in clean drinking water all of these things so there are fundamental things we need to get done i agree with you but i think you will admit that i said that in my remarks i'm not at all pretending that just being the third largest economy is uh, is enough by itself on the contrary it shows that we have the capacity to do better than we've done so far india is a land of paradoxes i've written that so often uh we and i gave you some paradoxes in my own speech but i i think that in some ways one of the paradoxes that both captures the nature of our country and hope uh, is a, is a paradox of a photograph that went around the internet during the last kumbh mela when uh, it was a photograph of a sadhu a completely naked sadhu by the way and right out of hollywood central casting you know he had a scraggly hair ash on his forehead rudraksha mala around his neck you know uh, wispy beard around his chin completely bare torso you know for all the world a picture of timeless otherworldliness the guy without a single material possession completely bare and so on but in this photograph this naked sadhu was chatting away on a mobile phone now that is part of the paradox of india right it's it's the fact that we are a country where a naked sadhu can chat away on a mobile phone and and i think that if we can get around the fact that yes we have these enormous problems but we also paradoxically have within the same nation the capacity to overcome them as i said through high technology and so on we should actually build on that um uh, can we have the mic to mr sunil here and vishnu in all fairness we should also have the mic going yeah. to the back of the room the yeah now now we'll spread it across properly yeah so one here one uh, we move diagonal yeah uh so uh, if you look at the last 6 to 9 months do you really feel that with the kind of uh, happening what the judiciary and the media is doing okay uh, we'll have a question now this left in the meantime i would like to welcome mr bhutia mrs khitan and mrs roy thank you um so on the international level india has managed to make a number of strategic partners in terms of you know the relations with the usa but even now the dream to or uh, obtain a permanent seat in the UNSC remains pretty far fetched um you having been in the united nations for over 30 years would you think do you see this dream succeeding in the next few years also with passing years the importance of the united nations is coming down so what do you think you know there are number of reforms that are being spoken about that the united nations needs but none of them have actually come into action till now so what are you your views on it what a smart young girl thank you for that question um 
on the on the question of um, the permanent seat that's i'm afraid a, a rather long and complicated answer but very simply it's the whole question of security council reform has become like a malady with a bunch of doctors gathered around the patient and they all agree on the diagnosis but they can't agree on the prescription and everyone agrees that the security council reflects the geopolitical realities of 1945 and not of today uh, to give you just a couple of examples when the un was established the security council was uh, a grand total of uh, 11 members out of a total un membership of just 51 countries today it's 15 members out of 193 countries we've gone from 22% of the members being on the council to fewer than 8% then if you look at another factor europe with 5% of the world's population today has 33% of the seats in the council in those days there were much more than 5% of the population the members of the un or if you look at the fact that the permanent members are all countries that claim to have won the second world war but how can you today in 2012 justify anything on the grounds of a war they happened to have won 67 years ago and so on and so forth so you can see that uh, the, the the problem of the security council's uh, composition is definitely one that knows most people will not disagree with but if you then have to find a solution to it that's when the challenge comes up that's the problem of the prescription because to change that you need to amend the un charter the un charter requires a two thirds majority in the general assembly 128 countries and then that has to be ratified and in most countries ratification is a parliamentary procedure so it has to be approved by the parliaments of two thirds of the world's countries including those of all five permanent members in other words you want a formula that is simultaneously acceptable to two thirds of the world and is not unacceptable to the five countries whose powers you're actually trying to dilute you understand so it's a it's a very very difficult formula to find and so far every such formula has been very elusive because the countries that hope to benefit from council reform like india they all want it but those who feel they won't benefit they are quite strongly opposed to it in our country you know perfectly well that pakistan is going around saying over our dead body that india should have uh, and and frankly some of the other asian countries like indonesia and so on are also not particularly happy with india stealing a march on them and getting such a status in africa there's no agreement about who should get it between the oldest civilization egypt the largest democracy in nigeria and the largest economy south africa or in latin america you got brazil which is um, analogous to india in terms of its place in the latin american region versus our place in the subcontinent but all the countries of the region speak spanish brazil is a portuguese speaking country and countries like mexico and argentina don't wish to yield this honor to brazil so just identifying the countries and even in europe you know there was talk of germany and japan getting it at that point the italian foreign minister of the day said what's all this talk about germany and japan after all we lost the war too so even in europe there is a, a, a disagreement about how to to go ahead with this so i'm afraid it looks like it's going to be a very very long process and my worry is that the longer it takes the second part of your question comes into being the un looks less and less relevant and if tomorrow let's say the british or the french veto something that's happening in southern africa and south africa is not present or something happening in our subcontinent and we are not there will we respect such a veto we may we may disagree or we may not agree with such an action and the credibility and clout of the security council will suffer in the process there are always other bodies that can fill the vacuum like the g20 and so on so i would urge uh, the countries that are currently blocking security council reform to rethink their opposition and try and make it happen so that we in india uh, can answer the question differently when young bright people like you ask it but uh, i wouldn't put any bets on it happening in the immediately foreseeable future yeah before Dr. before the youngster asks the next question i'll interrupt here This ladies lady, and gentlemen lady has a continuation of the previous question it really make sense doctor whether we get a seat on the un security council or not would it really make a difference probably uh, yes and no is the answer yes in the sense that it would first of all be an acknowledgement of india's stature in the world it is to some degree a matter of pride that you are one of the handful of countries deemed to be so indispensable to the effectiveness and success of the world body that you are given a permanent seat on the security council so it's that level of stature if you look at 1945 these were the five big countries in the world and everyone saw that they were special enough and different enough that they couldn't imagine the un without those countries and so they didn't even have to be elected they were there permanently 
Today, if you, were to, if you were to invent a UN today and ask who are the countries you can't imagine the UN without, we think we are worthy of being one of those countries. So in that sense, India should be a country that is on the Security Council. Uh, and and it, it's a recognition of our stature and it's a recognition of our ability to contribute to the global resolution of problems and disputes and so on. But on the other hand, you can say it wouldn't make much of a difference in that whatever India is or will be, it can be or cannot be whether it's a member of that club or any other club. And right now, um, we are a temporary member, a two-year member, an elected member, a non-permanent member of the council right now. And though we've been quite active on the council, one can't really say that what we've done or haven't done has made a very major difference. It is more a question of India as a responsible 21st century state of a certain size, a certain amount of economic clout, a certain amount of heft in the world, wanting to say, yes, we are prepared to play such a role. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to interrupt here. Uh, there have been two kind people here during the session who have volunteered to get associated with the round table. Uh, I would like to name Mr. Vinay Agarwal, who didn't want to get recognized. And we have Mr. Manav Bansal of BK Steel and Industries. Uh, can we please recognize you, sir? <laughs> there. They've been kind enough to get associated with the round table as donors. Uh, at a at this juncture, I would like to remind you there's a memo on all the seats and table wherein you can fill your contact yeah. details. If you're interested, drop it back and we will get in touch with you. The memo looks like something this. Moving back to the questions, we'll have last Thank few you. questions. A young lady here. Um, yeah, Dr. Tharoor, I have read your book, The Great Indian Novel, in innumerable book. times and I love it. But Thank you. what I wonder every single time I read is that what inspired you to merge the Mahabharat with our Indian history? So <laughs> that's the main question that's on my mind. Well, where do ideas and inspirations come from? I think by definition it's unknowable. Uh, ideas and inspirations basically come from who you are, what you've read, what you've seen, what you think about. And they just fuse together the way in which two sticks rub together in a certain moment might create a spark. And in my case, I would say that um, uh, it's, I've been obsessed with Indian history. I did a history degree in college, even though my marks would have qualified me for any other subject, uh, because I cared about history. And I, I, I was reading, in fact, P. Lal's transcreation of the Mahabharata, when it struck me what an extraordinarily racy, lively narrative this is, and how it could easily be a contemporary story. Here is an epic that between 400 BC and 400 AD, for 800 years, was told and retold uh, as, as the great story of the events of its time, with new stories being added, new digressions, new interpolations. And then suddenly, after 800 years, we stopped retelling it. So I asked myself, what if we had not stopped retelling it? What would have made us in the 20th century write about the great events of his time? And from that idea was born the notion <coughs> of taking the great events of the 20th century, which is, of course, the nationalist movement and the freedom struggle, and grafting it onto the epic in, and, and trying to tell in epic mode, but in a satirical vein, because the conceit would otherwise have been impossible to sustain, a satirical retelling of the political history of 20th century India for the framework narrative of the Mahabharata. And I, I obviously had a lot of fun writing it, and I hope you had fun reading it too. Uh, just you. to interrupt here, we'll ha have the Q&A round till 8.55 last. So, I mean, sorry to uh, whoever I can't manage. Yeah, the gentleman here on the left, yeah. Uh, good evening. My question is about tonight's topic, that is opportunities and challenges. Uh, the Economist, a publication in the U.S., talks about our biggest challenge being job creation. Yeah. We are empowering the youth with education, which all NGOs are doing, but they're getting frustrated because there are no jobs. My question is about jobs and about alternate employment, whether it be sports or any other form of employment. What do you see the role in our country? Yeah, I'm 100% in agreement that job creation is vital, and I stress that, that we need to create an economy that actually offers people opportunities to get work, decent work, as I said, and at the same time that we have to train and equip them to take that work. It's ironic that people claim there are no jobs, and yet I meet employers every day who tell me they can't find labor for the things they need. Uh, there are people running textile mills, uh, carpet factories, all sorts of things, who simply cannot get labor, and they're paying significant money. In Kerala, the land of coconuts, you cannot find a coconut picker. There are jobs available that people are unwilling to do or are no longer trained to do. And this is where the mismatch between training, 
In other words, between employability and the availability of employment, that mismatch has to be overcome. And I'm not sure, frankly, that our National Skills Development Corporation, which is a government body, is doing that well enough just yet. I'm hoping they will. We, we have to try and get there. But this, to me, is, a, is the vital answer. Uh, we also have to look very frankly at our labor laws, which right now are written to protect those who already have jobs rather than provide incentives for others to come in and invest in ways that will create new jobs. So all of these have to be attended to. But if we don't do that, you're quite right. It's a very, very major danger. It's uh, almost the last two or three questions. Yeah, the gentleman here in the white. Good Sorry. evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, I want to talk about a few of the legislations either uh, which are already law or are pending in front of the parliament like the NREGA, the Food Security Act, the Land Acquisition Bill. The way I see it is uh, they are stifling wealth creation uh, and uh, ultimately, you know, they're going to st stifle uh, poverty reduction, poverty alleviation, uh, as you might put it. What are you, your views on these uh, laws or legislations which are either there or pending. Each one would have a different impact, but I certainly would not agree with you uh, that something like the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act is stifling wealth creation. What it's actually done is it has created wealth in the hands of people who never had it before. I've spoken, I agree that because it's implemented in each state differently, uh, that the implementation is uneven and that in some, case, some cases perhaps it hasn't worked as well. But I can tell you in Kerala, I've spoken to women working in projects under this. And the fact that, uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, it's a scheme under which every family below the poverty line in rural India is entitled for one member to get 100 days of paid employment from the government uh, without any questions asked, whatever their qualifications are. And, and that has actually pumped a lot of money into the hands of people who wouldn't have it. I met a woman, for example, who had a handicapped daughter, and she was saying that that daughter of hers would have had to be given to an orphanage were it not for the fact that the government had given her this work and she now had the money to be able to afford to look after the child at home. Tremendously moving stories like that. Now, you've got that kind of thing and at the same time, what you're doing is you're putting money in the hands of people who didn't have money before, so you're increasing the purchasing power of rural India. To some degree, that has contributed to food inflation, but at least it means people can buy what they want and not just get handouts. On top of that, people who have money in their hands should actually be helping your economy grow because they are able to spend that money buying goods and services that people like you can manufacture and produce for them. So I don't see this as stifling wealth creation at all. I actually see it as an engine for actually improving wealth creation. And I think that some of the economists have been a bit too conventional in their criticism because they've looked at fiscal deficit and that kind of issues, you know, that the government is spending money that it should actually be using to pay down the debt. It's increasing its current account deficit. That's the sort of criticism. No one can truly say it's stifling wealth creation because the evidence is to the contrary. And even where people are not spending the money, it's going into bank accounts and the banks can use it to grow the economy. You know that the government no longer pays the money in cash to a contractor. You absolutely have to have a bank account and something like 9 million new bank accounts have been opened only because of the scheme so that workers can get money directly into their accounts. So it's actually this scheme has worked, in my view, rather well, unevenly implemented across different parts of India, but in places where it has been implemented well, it's transformed lives for the better and in a way that can transform our society for the better too. Uh, sir, firstly, it's an honor for me to be addressing you. So my you. question to you is that uh, do you feel that in the 21st century, in, when we talk about business, truth and complete honesty in business transactions are actually are, are words of a bygone era or do they stand true in today's world too? Actually, I think they stand truer in today's world, young man, because... In the old days, people were able to get away with much more uh, uh, cutting of corners and fudging the books. Today, we live in a much more transparent world. There's much greater accountability. There are many more ways of checking on, on how, uh, how companies, for example, are behaving. Uh, one of the reasons the Satyam thing broke or the Enron's uh, shell game was exposed is because today, shareholders, auditors, and the media have far more access to information about what corporations are actually doing. So truth and honesty in business is actually going up today because the price, uh, the risks of not being truthful and honest are much greater than they used to be. Uh, transparency, the internet, the mass, mass media, the increasing uh, openness of, of democracy, all of this has made it much more difficult and dangerous to be dishonest. So I believe it's a good time to promote and push honesty hmm? in the corporate world.
Friends, lots of interesting questions, lots of interesting answers. We are taking the last question. Sir, I was told to ask you a fitting last question. Uh, so pardon my forthrightedness and also... A forthright apolog- last question is a good idea. And, and apologies to any friends from Portugal in the audience. Uh, but can I ask you, when can we expect Dr. Shashi Tharoor to become the next foreign minister of India? <laughs> You should be asking somebody else that question. (laughs) Because since I can't appoint myself to that or any other position, you have to ask those who are in a position to appoint. But frankly, I don't think that that's particularly likely. You've seen our our political system has its own logic and its own way of doing things. And I think that, um, that at this stage, I've got to be focused on being the best member of parliament I can possibly be. And I'm very proud to inform you that I became, last December, the first Indian MP to issue a half-term report to his constituents. I thought many students have to issue half-term reports, so I said, let me do that. And I listed over a dozen pages uh, the headlines of everything that I had done for the constituency, what I had tried and failed, what I had accomplished, and of course, half a page of that was what I had done for the country as minister as well. And I did try and say to the public, hold me accountable, and I will keep updating these reports so that you would know what it is I believe I've done. Uh, with the trust that you placed in me through your votes. So that is something, something of an example I hope I can set. The party has given me the opportunity to make a major contribution in a number of parliamentary debates. I led our treasury benches on the annual debate on foreign policy. I spoke as the, the second speaker from my side on the Lokpal bill. I spoke on the black money debate. I've had a number of opportunities to contribute to the national conversation in parliament on important issues. So I feel that I'm making a contribution in my own way, and uh, certainly uh, I hope that if I plug away at it long enough, I'll get an opportunity to make a contribution in other ways as well. But thank you for asking. Thank you. For, for the other questions, I would just like to say, as we all know, Dr. Tharoor has written many books which are on sale outside at the bookstall. <laughs> uh, on that, I no, I didn't mean that, Rohit. That what I meant was you can uh, have the books purchased Dr. Tharoor will be available on the dais for signing of the books. I'm sure you can have a few questions shared further also. Uh, uh, sitting beside you, sir, I'm going to take the liberty to ask you a last question. Take the mic. So, uh, I, I believe your last book was in 2001, The Riot. Uh, that was my last novel, but I published non-fiction. So, so, where's the writer, Shashi Tharoor, now? Oh, the writer is still in here, sort of waiting to break free of the <laughs> political cage into which I've put so it. So has the country lost a writer for a politician? Uh, I no, I hope not. I, I've often joked to people that, you know, I'm already known as a former minister. One day I'll be known as a former MP, but I hope I'll never be known as a former writer. <laughs> so that's always, uh, always going to be part of who I am. Uh, I, I can I, say in all truthfulness that uh, it is a struggle to find the time to write in political life because... Politics, particularly Lok Sabha politics, is extremely demanding because you're constantly accountable to very demanding constituents who ask a lot of you, and they're entitled to ask it. That's the way our system is. So I'm spending, I must be issuing, I'm not exaggerating, about 250 letters a week on various issues to various ministries, government departments, and so on, about issues and problems raised by my constituents. And uh, that doesn't leave a lot of time for sitting around writing novels. But I will say that... um, that I am working on a book right now. I've been struggling for a couple of years to find the time to finish it. A non-fiction book about India's place in the world of the 21st century, a sort of foreign policy book, but written not for scholars, not a single footnote, really written for intelligent, thoughtful people like you to understand a little bit about India's place in the world. And I hope that that book will be out, will be completed and published this year itself. Uh, As for fiction, um, I would love to be able to go back to fiction, but my worry about fiction is that you need not just time, which is scarce enough for me, but you also need a place inside your head to construct an alternative universe, universe, to populate it with characters, episodes, dialogues, that are as real to you as those of the people you're meeting in your daily life. And that's very difficult in the kind of life I'm leading today. Uh, Fiction is not interruptible. Nonfiction, you can interrupt and pick up the threads even three, four weeks later and continue writing. With fiction... If you put your pen down or your keyboard down and go off and do something completely unrelated, then the truth is that by the time you come back to it, the illusion you've created for yourself and for your reader is shattered. So fiction has been a challenge. It'll take a really hardworking effort to carve out daily time to inhabit another world. So we'll see when 
the next novel will come out. I've got three novel ideas bubbling away at the back of my head. But at least a non-fiction book I hope to promise you all in 2012.